Okay, good evening. We are now recording. Uh, again, welcome to our September meeting for Beaches Watch. Um, we have a, a very exciting uh, panel tonight to talk about a very timely issue um, about flooding and sea level rise and coastal resilience, uh, given what Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama just went through um, with Hurricane Ida. So we look forward to uh, a very informative session to see what the American Flood Coalition is all about and what they are doing to uh, help cities and citizens and um, municipalities kind of combat this. So before we get started with the panel, I just have some brief announcements. Um, as I said, we are videoing our, our meeting tonight, as we always do. You can find it tomorrow on our YouTube channel at Beaches Watch 2012. Um, we are also, uh, we, you know, have our membership is always uh, in the full swing, so you can renew or join for 2021. Uh, it's $15 for individual, $20 for family, and $5 for students. Uh, the yearly memberships run from January through December. Uh, you can, if you if you uh, renew your membership uh, between October and the end of the year, that will uh, set you up for 2022. So you can renew your membership and or make a donation online at our beacheswatch.com website. Uh, let's see, do we have any uh, elected officials or other uh, dignitaries we would like to recognize at this time? Uh, let's see. I don't see any, sometimes they'll come in a little late, but right now we do not have anyone, but we do appreciate those attendees who have uh, joined us. Um, oh, I always forget, I'm so sorry. We have our, our leader, Sandy Golding, who is the city of Jacksonville Beach um, city councilwoman. Sandy, it, it, she's always here. So I guess that's why I always forget about that. I'm so sorry, Sandy, but yes, <laughs> she's... Um, one of our one of our city leaders. Um, we are looking to start recruiting our Beaches Watch board members. Uh, our uh, officer elections are coming up in December, and we are currently seeking persons with any of the following experience: uh, accounting and finance, uh, membership recruitment, retention, and public relations and marketing. So, if you're interested in serving on the board. Uh, please uh, visit our, um, we have an online application uh, at, um, at our, it's, uh, on our website and you can uh, apply online as well as upload your resume or any other pertinent documentation documents that you would like for us to review. Um, but we would love to um, have you consider joining our board. Uh, we are always looking for the, the talent that's within our community. Uh, Labor Day is coming up, so some city meeting schedules have changed. Uh, Jacksonville Beach will now be meeting on Tuesday, September 7th at 6 p.m. Neptune Beach will be meeting on Wednesday, September 8th at 6 p.m. Um, it's still budget time, so final approval is coming up. Atlantic Beach budget approval, uh, their proposed millage rate is staying the same as last year, 3.2285. The hearings will be held on September the 13th, uh, and the final reading and adoption will be September the 27th. Uh, Jacksonville Beach, uh, their proposed millage is also staying the same as last year's 3.9947. Their budget hearings first reading will be September the 8th, and uh, final reading and adoption will be September the 13th. Neptune Beach, their budget uh, proposed millage is also remaining same as last year, 3.3656 and their budget hearing, uh, which is their final hearing to adopt the budget and millage rate will be September 20th. Jacksonville Beach is undergoing their charter review. So uh, they have their meeting set up uh, for September the 23rd, uh, as well as September the 26th. And please note that the um, possibly changing the height limit is expected to be suggested by certain council members. Um, and as you know, all the beaches have a 35 foot height limit in their commercial business district, or actually throughout their, their whole their city limits. But um, this is something that we are monitoring and um, we you know, encourage you to attend uh, for those who live in Jack's Beach. 
Our, our October meeting is October 6th. Um, this will be about Mayport Village updates. There's been uh, a lot of activity with, uh, surrounding the Mayport Village and our speaker will be Alice Decker. Uh, she is, she heads up the Mayport Waterfront Partnership. So again, that's October 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, I think that is all of the announcements. Um, so we will get on, go straight to our, our panelists just, uh, tonight. Um, they have a lot of information to share and it's regarding proactive solutions for flood resiliency and sea level rise. And we are happy to have Dr. Alec Bogendorf. Uh, he's the Florida Director for the American Flood Coalition. Uh, Anna Baker, who is also with the Florida American Flood Coalition, as well as Rolanda Hernandez. And we will go ahead and turn this over to our panelists and um, look forward to an informative session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and for having us today. Um, I'm Alec Bogdanoff. I am the Florida Director for the American Flood Coalition. I'm a policy trained oceanographer and meteorologist um, and re run the kind of the Florida level uh, work for the American Flood Coalition. Um, so we're excited to talk to you all a little, tell you a little bit about our organization, our mission, um, some of the resources we have and talk a little bit more about why this issue matters to the state of Florida. Um, on the next slide, uh, just, just to introduce the folks joining me today. So I'm excited to have Anna Baker, uh, who is our Senior Outreach Director. Anna, if you wanna say hello. Yes, thank you, Alec. I'm Anna Baker. Uh, I am. I lead our outreach uh, across the nation at AFC and my background is in resilience planning in both the public and private sector. Um, I'm a registered landscape architect and work very closely with Alec and Rolando and I will pass it to Rolando. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Rolando and I am a program analyst at the American Flood Coalition. I work hand in hand with Anna and Alec, as they mentioned. And prior to joining AFC, I worked with the National Park Service and led their green infrastructure initiative. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Alec. Yeah, thanks, Rolando. And um, I'm excited. Anna's gonna give an overview of the organization. Rolando is going to tell us about our mission and our four pillars, and then we'll get into some of the resources we offer. So Anna, take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so this is just a, a good way to introduce ourselves to any of you who've, who've never met with us before. Um, at the American Flood Coalition, we are focused on solutions to flooding and sea level rise, especially at the national level, but also local and state. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and a nonpartisan coalition. And as you can see on this slide, um, we work with a range of individuals and leaders and communities from federal champions who are members of Congress, um, cities, towns, and counties, elected officials at all levels, businesses, military groups, and civic and academic groups. And just for a glance of, of the scope of our work, uh, we have over 265 members across 21 states. Um, and in Florida, we have over 60 cities and counties as members, um, and those are dispersed geographically across the entire state, over 30 elected officials, and, and as you can see, a range of, of members of Congress, military groups, and civic organizations that, that work with us as well. And for a snapshot of some of the federal champions and members that we've engaged with that may be very relevant to you, um, you can see on the left of this slide, um, some of our featured coalition members. So um, we're really thankful to have council member Sandy Golding on the line with us today and, and proud that she's a member of the coalition. Mayor Ellen Glasser and council member Matt Carlucci are also members. Um, we're quite proud to have engaged with council member Carlucci and DeFore and others on the Jacksonville's um, special resiliency committee over the past year. Um, and then on the bottom, you see some of the municipalities that are members of the coalition, including the city of Neptune Beach, Atlantic Beach, city of Ponce Inlet and St. Augustine a bit further to the south. 
And then on the right, um, the three members of Congress who are all generally in your region. And with that, I will pass it to Rolando. Our Senior Outreach Director, Anna, just highlighted some of our local coalition members. Um, and, you know, local communities um, are really at the heart of our work and at the forefront. Uh, AFC's mission is to protect local communities who are facing flooding and sea level rise challenges. We recognize that this is an issue that is deeply affecting states like Florida at an increasingly rapid pace. And that is why we must act now to advance proactive solutions to this challenge. And then we go to the next one. Our four pillars. Uh, so these are our four pillars guided, um, that guide everything that we do at the coalition. Uh, our coalition was founded in the spring of 2018 and our founding 34 coalition members were local and state leaders from Florida and the state of Virginia. Uh, in collaboration with a bipartisan group of these founding members, we developed these pillars with the goal of identifying concepts that would encompass common sense, bipartisan solutions to flooding. Um, and of course, these four pillars include investing in infrastructure that boosts the economy and protects property values, proactively planning to keep communities safe and save taxpayer dollars, building back stronger to protect communities from future flooding, and last but not least, ensuring that our military installations are ready to deploy 365 days a year. So on what we offer, as many of you may be aware, the coalition is funded solely by institutional and philanthropic donors, which allow us to not charge membership fees and to be inclusive of members of varying economic backgrounds. Uh, so what do we do to support our coalition members? Well, we are a network of leaders and this allows for the starting of the best practices for tackling flooding, Every year, we also take on one to two pilots as well um, by providing funding and technical assistance at no cost to support local flood resilience effort. We also provide a platform for advocacy and education, and this includes hosting congressional briefings and summits in the nation's capital in Washington, DC, and supporting active dialogue between our local members and federal leaders. Um, and lastly, we assist local communities and leaders with communicating about flooding, and we build informational guides that help communities understand the complicated parts of this issue. Uh, so the, uh, the flood funding finder, as you see here, is one, of, is one example of an informational resource that we offer. Uh, we recently created this tool at the request of one of our coalition members. She and other mayors were looking for better ways to navigate federal funding for local flood resilience noting that not all communities have the capacity to really parse through um, every federal funding source on, um, on flooding out there. Uh, this, pu uh, this publicly accessible, accessible web-based tool uh, really breaks down 24 federal grant and technical assistance program for flooding projects. Uh, individuals can go and search through the tool and find programs that match their local funding needs with the option to filter based on different characteristics, such as, as if a funding source has a cost share requirement um, or if it requires a presidential disaster declaration as well, um, as well as noting logistical facts, such as when the application for that certain funding um, source is due. Ultimately, a person can generate a customized PDF of federal funding sources based on the specific criteria they select, which makes it easier. Um, and of course, why are these investments so important, you may ask? Well, I'll pass it to Alec to speak a little bit more about that. Thanks, Rolando. Yeah, I, so one of the biggest challenges in Florida is we think of flooding as just a coastal problem, but the reality is it's a challenge for the entire state. Um, so obviously being along the coast, you all are aware of sea level rise and the fact that sea level rise rates are accelerating uh, across most of the continental United States, uh, including in the Jacksonville area. And this is gonna not only impact coastal erosion, but also the effectiveness of drain systems like storm drains, thinking through you know, how we actually move water when it rains, 
um, out to the ocean. And speaking of rainfall, uh, we're starting to see heavier rainfall events. So, you know, the, the storms that we have designed for in the past uh, aren't necessarily indicative of the storms we're expecting in the future. And so this coupled with sea level rise is creating more flooding issues in our community. And as we've seen recently, uh, we are expecting to see more of the strongest types of storms. So the category three, four, and five hurricanes, um, you know, which are immensely devastating. Uh, we're beginning to see, you know, how Ida has impacted Louisiana. And these, you know, while the overall frequency of storms may not increase, uh, we are expecting the worst storms to become more frequent. And that coupled with sea level rise, which raises the mean sea level, means that storm surge can be faster, uh, more devastating in places that may already see it and go further inland than it used to. And this isn't just a physical issue, right? This isn't something that just damages communities, but it actually impacts the economy of the region and of the state. So we know that, you know, for example, sales tax and tourist development tax is at risk. Uh, if, you know, folks see areas as flooded, uh, they're not going to want to visit them as much. And we know that the tourism industry employs million people uh, and frankly, indirectly millions of people. And that is a concern uh, when thinking of pictures like the one you're seeing. Um, and, you know, this isn't just a picture that, that we highlighted for this presentation, but actually one that we've used in a lot of presentations in Florida, because it really just highlights the impact that flooding can have to businesses and affect, uh, you know, the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce. Um, the state's second largest industry is agriculture. And we know that uh, agriculture is at risk from changing rainfall patterns in places where there is groundwater close to the surface. Uh, we also know that groundwater is gonna be a challenge there as well. And it impacts Main Street businesses. Uh, you know, the federal government through FEMA tracks this data and 40, sometimes up to 60% of small businesses don't reopen after a flood disaster. So we need to make sure that these businesses don't flood in the first place and make sure a flood doesn't become a disaster. Property value is at risk. Florida homes have over $5 billion, have lost already uh, estimated $5 billion due to flooding. Um, this will directly impact revenue to local governments. This is just an estimate uh, since 2005, but you know a lot of folks are looking at these estimates increasing as flooding does as well. Bond ratings, the way local governments look at big projects is through bonds. And we know that the bond rating agencies are looking at proactive governments and rewarding them with better bond ratings, but they're also warning local governments that if they don't act, their bond ratings may be hurt in the long run. Next slide. And one of the ways we looked at this was uh, we, through the partnership with Johns Hopkins University, we actually published a flood resilient infrastructure and jobs creation um, report. And what was great is it just showed how federal investment can really stimulate both local markets and bring a lot of additional benefits. And so ultimately we could look at the impact that $1 million on flood resilient infrastructure has on business creation. And we were able to use this information when the state of Florida was looking at uh, passing at the time um, Senate bill 1954, the always ready legislation and show and really talk about the fact that this isn't just good for local governments, but it can be a strong economic driver for the state. Ultimately, this is one of, uh, it's a first of a kind study and really thought about how we can stimulate not just you know, federal investment, but also local economies. And so our uh, the team really looked at FEMA data in detail um, through 16 different communities between 2003 and 2018, focused on trying to really understand how resilient investments in infrastructure will drive economies. On the next slide, we just give a specific example, uh, diving into uh, this, how, what this means in the real world. And so for every million dollars invested in jobs, um, we know that 25 jobs are created in the construction industry and 15 jobs in the retail industry. So we have 40 jobs for every million dollars invested. And this also will 
um, help create uh, increases in foreign businesses. So really, we can drive our economy by investing in resilience, investing in protecting our communities. And I'm going to pass it to Anna to go through an example from uh, another community. Great. Yeah. So this is one of the case studies from the Johns Hopkins report. Um, it's the city of Meriden, Connecticut, and it is a park that is functioning as flood infrastructure. So as you can see in this photo, it's, it's a public space for recreation. There are many benefits that come um, from this park space that was renovated from um, an industrial part of the city. Uh, but now it is uh, constructed to not only mitigate flood risk um, and retain and filter stormwater um, and provide flood evacuation routes, but also provide these other benefits at the same time. So it's a great example of one project that's providing multiple benefits. Um, and this is a great segue into another guide that we recently produced. Um, in collaboration with the Dutch Embassy and Arcadis that covers a really similar topic to the Johns Hopkins report. So we wanted to pair um, some of the case studies from this guide with the report that Alec just highlighted. Um, so whereas the Johns Hopkins report really focused on that story of the linkage between flood resilience and job creation, this guide is um, meant to be used by local communities to understand which uh, approaches to flood resilience might work best for them. Um, it's designed to be applicable to communities of all sizes, especially those um, that are on the smaller side with populations of 50,000 or less. And it highlights 26 different approaches across the guide. Um, these approaches are broken into three types land use and policy, stormwater and drainage, and coastal and shoreline. And a key theme here, um, and one that we hear from many of our coalition members is the importance of mixing and matching different types of approaches together. So a beach can function well with um, land use um, planning and vulnerability assessments, and also with stormwater and drainage um, strategies in any given community. Um, and I imagine that you all at Beaches Watch are very familiar with, with that storyline. Uh, so with that said, I'm just going to give a couple examples of each type of these policy approaches that we looked into when we were developing this guide. Um, so in terms of land use and policy approaches, we looked at a range of different types of efforts that you can see on this slide, and we broke them down um, here it's generalized in the guide, there's more specificity um, based on cost. There's also an analysis of benefits and, and other elements of these projects. And for one example of a land use and policy approach, um, we wanted to highlight for you all today the multi-community vulnerab vulnerability assessment in Southeast Palm Beach County that's, that's underway right now. Um, this is a great example because it's multiple municipalities collaborating to create a vulnerability assessment for their shared region in order to reduce individual costs, avoid duplication, inform future planning, and lead to better investment strategies over the long run. Um, and it's notable that these seven municipalities vary in size. Um, some of them are smaller, some are larger. They've found um, innovative legal tools for establishing agreements to work together during this process. Next, in terms of stormwater and drainage approaches, again, this slide just highlights the range of approaches that, um, that we provide case studies for within the guide. And then for a couple of quick examples, um, we have the Good Neighbor Stormwater Park in North Miami, Florida. This is um, a little bit similar to the one that we just highlighted from the Johns Hopkins report in Meriden, Connecticut, but it's a much smaller scale. It's a single um, parcel of property um, in North Miami. The project cost around 150,000 um, to, to create this park from a vacant lot. Uh, the park now stores, can store, uh, 
20 times more water than it could have as a vacant lot. And it includes features that are designed not only um, to address up to two feet of sea level rise to store water, but also um, to provide an educational opportunity for the community to learn about stormwater and how it works. Um, so that's a quick example there. We also highlight the Charleston Rainproof Program. This is a really interesting program in Charleston that was somewhat modeled after a similar program called Amsterdam Rainproof in the Netherlands. It's a distributed system of water storage elements within the community, um, ranging from rain barrels to other elements. Um, Charleston has uh, storage under a parking lot within its community as well. Um, and it relies strongly on volunteer and, and partnership participation. So really interesting sort of distributed model here for um, storing rainwater. And then in terms of coastal and shoreline approaches, you'll see here the range of approaches that we covered. Um, since you all know so much about beaches, we, we didn't include an example of beaches here, but selected a couple of others that, that might also be really important for a coastal community um, that complement the, the beach and dune aspects. Um, so the first example is a flood ready wastewater treatment plant story from St. Augustine, Florida. Um, in this case, they looked at a range of options for um, improving flood resilience for the treatment plant to sea level rise and found a low cost measure that um, involved installing portable flood barriers. And then this project is a larger scale and more experimental example. Um, this is an approach called thin layer placement. Um, in this case, in Jekyll Island, um, it involved the process of deepening a channel, dredging sediment from that channel, and then placing the sediment on a tidal marsh in order to raise the elevation of the marsh and to, um, by raising it, buffer inland areas from flooding uh, that might be caused by sea level rise. So this is the first time this, this type of work was piloted in Georgia. There are other cases where it has been successfully implemented. Um, it was a more expensive project, but it did receive federal funding as a part of that. All right, and I will pass it to Alec. We just wanted to really paint the picture of the, the different kinds of local, local resilience options that we hear about from our coalition members that we um, encourage sharing ideas about across our network and that we've included in some of our informational resources. And with that, I will pass it to you, Alec. Thanks, Anna. Um, and one of the things that we, we worked on recently and we're incredibly proud of is that the state of Florida recently passed the Always Ready legislation. Um, this was significant uh, reforms and changes on the way the state's going to think about resilience. Um, first of all, it provides funding for vulnerability assessments. There's $20 million available this year. Uh, previously, there had been on the order of a million to two million available. So about 10 times as much money uh, available here. It creates a statewide sea level rise assessment and flood assessment, basically looking statewide at infrastructure and what's at risk, helping the state plan long-term for what they need to do. It creates a the Florida Flood Hub for Applied Research and Innovation at the University of South Florida at St. Petersburg, uh, bringing together academics, industry experts, government as well, to really start thinking about how we model this on a statewide level. It's, it help, it, from this data and from the vulnerability assessments, there's gonna be a statewide plan for sea level rise and flooding. Ultimately, they're gonna take this information collected um, and provide a, a list of projects to the legislature to help fund every year. And so right now the legislature is appropriating about $100 million annually. Uh, this will be the first year actually projects were due to DEP September 1st, uh, actually I think by five o'clock today, um, they were, uh, DEP will uh, compile those, put a list together by December 1st and the legislature hopefully next session will fund this. Uh, there is $600 million available this year. They put $500 million from the federal stimulus dollars into the 
uh, into resilient infrastructure as well as the hundred million dollars in annual appropriation. Um, maybe it'll be more in the future. And of course, um, one of the things that we were really keen on is that smaller local governments like the ones often on our coast are um, not always able to fill out complex grant applications to really understand what is needed. And so these regional resilience coalitions, in your case, you all have a strong regional planning council that's been leading a resilience effort, um, has the ability to apply for money to help provide technical support to smaller local governments that might need support in the future. And so we wanted to just highlight that this is a huge step forward for the state of Florida. I know that a lot of your communities are already thinking about applying for these funds and likely already did for the year. Um, and so we wanted to just make sure you all were aware of this incredible opportunity. On top of the beaches money the legislature put in, on top of the water quality money, there's also resilience money. And so um, I, I wanted to thank you all for um, taking the opportunity, letting us take the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, both of the links were shared in the um, chat by Rolando just now. Um, so feel free to look at those and peruse and let us know if you have any questions. Um, the next slide has our contact information. Feel free to contact myself, Anna, Rolando, and our colleague, Annabelle, who has led a lot of the wonderful work we've done in Northwest Florida. So thank you all again and happy to take some questions. Well, this has been Awesome. I mean, the uh, what you guys have done in such a short period of time. I think you said you were fun, you were founded in 2018 is just nothing short of amazing. So um, I have been kind of monitoring the chat box as well as well as you all have, and um, I, I and this is probably already a, a known. But have you got, have you guys had an opportunity to meet with and start uh, establishing a relationship with our new? Chief Resiliency Officer here in Jacksonville. Um, yeah, we 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 have. I haven't directly yet, but I know that um, one of our new senior advisors is the former DP Secretary Noah Valenstein, and he has uh, communicated with her as well as uh, Sean Lahav has um, spoken with her, and so it is in the works uh, for us to have a conversation. We just haven't been able to connect yet. Okay, great, great. Um, Sean, I actually know Sean personally. He was one of my students in the environmental leadership program at UNF, and uh, he's one of our rock stars and uh, has done a lot of work on this with um, the through the regional council. So I was I, I was assumed that he had already met with you guys and and you uh, met, met with the with them and uh, and uh, every and all the partners there too. Um, the the tidal marsh uh, project was really interesting. So. And the first thing that came to our mind was, you know, what kind of what would what, what was the environmental or what could be the environmental impact on that, adverse or not? Um, and you said that you kind of this is a fairly new uh, pilot program. So can you speak to speak to that? I think you had compared it to another project similar to this. Um, yeah. Um... I can't speak to it in great technical depth, but I do know that attention has, has been paid to that aspect. Um, it was, uh, it, so I'm trying to think of the best resource to offer to you. We can absolutely follow up with some more info on that um, from the Army Corps of Engineers and also from the Jekyll Island Authority on the way they've, they've analyzed that. Um, so, so as you know, we are um, dredging or deepening the St. John's River to allow the larger uh, cargo ships to come into port. Um, is that something that you guys will kind of be working on with, with our city leaders as far as, um, you know, the, uh, obviously the flooding, the, the wakes from the bigger ships, um, you know, and kind of that, what that environmental impact is going to potentially be um, with regard to, you know, we're all obviously concerned about the flooding as well, the sea level rise and that sort of thing. Have you guys been involved in that, com that, that conversation at all? We, we're aware of what's going on generally as an organization, we don't dive into specific projects. 
what we're happy to do is provide resources and advice as you all are thinking through some of the questions and challenges that might come from uh, that. I know it is something that a lot of communities deal with. Uh, Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale is going through a deepening and widening project as well. Um, so there are good resources out there that may highlight some of the questions and potential challenges that you all are facing as you move through this process. And we're happy to serve as a resource. Um, yeah, we kind of feel like the horse has left the barn, as they say in that one. But obviously, you know, we're still um, kind of in the beginning phases of that. And so we're obviously concerned about it. Um, so another question is, what does the city or town or community need to do in order to get AFC support and or backing? Um, you've shown your partnerships that you have now. Um, can you kind of walk us through that process? I'll start and then I'll pass it to Anna to talk a little bit more. Um, but membership comes at no cost and with no obligation. And so generally the first step for any local government is to join as a member. And then Anna can talk a little bit about some of the resources and then how we work with our members. Yeah, so Rolando um, in one of his earlier slides, he highlighted that in some cases we, we, we engage at different levels. Um, and so there are some cases where we will do a more in-depth pilot. Um, we've provided small grants or technical assistance to localities that are pursuing a particular flood resilience project. And, and we've tended to um, select projects that have takeaways and learnings that can be beneficial to many of our coalition members. So um, I think that kind of speaks to an important theme, which is we are really interested in supporting our coalition members broadly as a group, um, as opposed to, um, you know, advocating for a specific project in a specific city. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a really important part of our approach. But yes, as Alex said, it's um, feel free to reach out to us uh, if if you know of a community that would like to join the coalition. It's a very simple process, and it is it is free. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see if there are any other questions in the queue. Um, let's see, I don't, I don't see anything right now. Um, have you guys uh, had an opportunity to, um, to talk to um, uh, Kay e. Haas, who is the CEO of um, Groundwork Jacks? Their Groundwork Jacks is taking on building what's called the Emerald Trail in in the core of downtown uh connecting neighborhoods um uh we're, you know also addressing the flooding problems with some of the creeks down there with pollution that sort of thing are you are you, are you guys familiar with that project at all and it sounded very familiar with um what was it the meriden uh, project I'm familiar with the project. We haven't directly interacted with them, but again, you know, we're always open to it. And if folks want to make connections, we'd, we'd love to talk with folks. I think, you know, there's a lot of communities that are facing these questions. Uh, you know, Jacksonville, um, looking at the Emerald Trail, uh, Fort Lauderdale is doing Lauder Trail. Miami just finished the underline and their waterfront design guidelines. So I think a lot of communities are starting to think about pathways in activating the waterfront and obviously flooding is front and center. So um, it, we would love to connect with them and kind of think through if it can be an example for other folks um, on how to deal with it, both from a flood perspective and also from a community engagement perspective. Right, right. And providing, as you were saying, uh, you know, green space, recreational space, bringing in tourists, that sort of thing. You know, it's kind of the whole, the whole package, if you will. Um, Let's see. If there's anything else? Um, so it sounds like with the um, the 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 hundred million dollars that I guess has been appropriated or earmarked, um, uh, was that was that kind of from top down with the governor with the governor's office or was it bottom up with the local officials and the and the elected officials going to Tallahassee? How did how did that come about? 
It is a mixture of a lot of things. Obviously, the, the governor has made the environment a priority. Um, mm -hmm. The speaker and Senate president also made resilience a priority. They had heard over and over from their constituents uh, mm -hmm. that flooding and sea level rise is a challenge for their communities and something needed to be done. Um, so they came together and crafted a really ambitious policy agenda. Um, and obviously it had almost a pretty much unanimous support in both chambers and was signed by the governor. So um, while, you know, it, you can say, okay, was it top down, bottom up? Uh, all politics is local. So the reason why they cared was because they heard from their constituents and from their mayors that this was a top priority for them. Yeah, we'd like to, we would like to hope that it's all local. <laughs> so we do a really hard, uh, uh, we do a, try to do a really good job in keeping that home rule and local, the local rule here. So, but that, but that was really, really, really good to hear. Um, so question, is there anything that AFC is doing to assist the members of Atlantic Beach and Neptune Beach directly? I, I know Atlantic Beach, is, they've uh, had their own reports, resiliency and adaptation reports and things like that in different phases. So, and we did see that our mayor is um, part of the, uh, part, uh, has joined the coalition as well. So anything you can speak to specifically about those two communities? Yeah, I mean, I, I will kick us off and I welcome Alec to chime in. Um, it's been an unusual year plus, obviously, because of the pandemic. So we have not been able to be in person um, meeting with Mayor Brown, Mayor Glasser, other members of, of those communities as often as we would like. Um, that said, uh, those relationships, I think it's important to start the answer to this question back um, in the fall of 2019 and the spring of 2020. Um, in the fall of 2019, we hosted a summit for Florida mayors in Washington, DC. Um, and we had 20 mayors from across Florida attend. Uh, and we were really proud that Mayor Brown of Neptune Beach uh, what was a speaker on a Hill briefing that we organized with the Florida congressional delegation. And she was speaking directly to, to the beaches issues in your area. Um, so that's a really important highlight to share. Um, we then were, were visiting with, um, with council member Golding, with Mayor Glasser, with Mayor Brown um, in the spring of 2020 to understand um, and, and meet the city staff that are leading the efforts you just described and to understand ways that we might be able to assist. So since that time, we've certainly stayed in touch and provided um, informational resources um, when, when requested. And, and of course, um, we have a monthly newsletter and a number of other channels for sharing timely information with our coalition members about opportunities for funding or, or other um, helpful resources that, that might be valuable. Excellent. Anything anyone else wants to add? Um, I think Rolando, you had mentioned about grants and some cities and municipalities don't really have the resources to fill out you know, the compli complicated applications for grants. And I wasn't sure, is that something that you guys, um, uh, is that something that you guys would help with or, or assist those smaller cities or if they're trying to apply for these grants? Most definitely. <clears throat> I'll start us off and Anna and Alec, please chime in. But um, as I mentioned in one of our member resources, one of our informational resources at the American Flood Coalition's website is the Flood Funding Finder. Mm -hmm. uh, and this tool just makes it way more accessible for uh, cities and towns, uh, officials, and just the the common person to go online and look at the flooding opportunities that um, are out there for them, both federally and locally as well. Um, the tool is going to be expanding as well, but as of now we have 24 programs um, that they can definitely look into and filter out based on their, on their needs. Uh, there are many others. Uh, so I'll stop there and see if Anna and Alec have anything to add. Yeah, and, and I would say, um, you know, obviously with, uh, hundreds of members, it's challenging to actually help draft 
individual applications, but that was one of the reasons why when we were looking at, you know, working uh, with the legislature on the always ready legislation, really wanted to think through how we built capacity on a regional level so that the regional resiliency coalitions could actually fill that void. Um, be, at the end of the day, knowing the local governments and having those relationships and saying, hey, you know, it would be great if Atlantic Beach and Neptune Beach worked on this application together because both of you want to work on like similar uh, objectives. So for us, I think we're really focused on helping to build capacity on regional levels that there is this opportunity to help local governments. Um, we've actually provided grants and helped start some of the regional resilience coalitions in the state of Florida because we so strongly believe that these regional collaborations are really going to help build the capacity needed uh, in these regions to help the smaller municipalities that may not have the resources to approach these challenges on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think you said that like the regional councils, uh, at least throughout Florida, are being helpful as well with their with their resources and their support in this capacity as well i think yes and i, I know you know uh, a lot of the regions have created these regional resilience entities i don't know that jacksonville has officially um but i you know i know that the north florida region is has talked about it quite a bit um ultimately uh I think that will be uh, the pathway forward. Um, you know, I don't know what that looks like for your community. I think it's a good place to engage, um, but we know that Emerald Coast, Appalachia, both are starting regional planning, our regional resilience coalitions. Obviously there's the East Central Florida, um, Tampa Bay, South Florida, uh, Southwest is also trying to get going as well. So eventually we'll end up with, hopefully these regional resilience coalitions met somewhat the boundaries of the regional planning councils. A lot of the regional planning councils are providing the operational support for them mm -hmm. since the, you know, to really provide uh, an entity to manage that day to day. Right, right. We haven't spoken too much about the military aspect of, of your part of your mission. Um, and of course we have Mayport Naval Air Station to the north uh, neighbor of ours. And um, can you speak any, anything specifically about that relationship and, and even NAS in Jacksonville, but because obviously they're, they're downtown, so we're in the downtown area. Yeah. Uh, military readiness is so important in Florida uh, across the state, obviously for, for the Jacksonville area, it is a huge deal. Um, actually our first legislative win as an organization was a um, amendment to the, the national defense um, legislation. It basically was called defense access roads. So it allowed, right, basically there were very exact reasons when the Department of Defense could spend money off base on particular access roadways. Flooding was not included. And so if a roadway was flooding and you couldn't get to the base, uh, it was a challenge. So we actually changed federal law and allow, and now the Department of Defense can spend money to fix flooding roads um, off base to make sure that their uh, service men and women can get to the base as needed. And I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add. I'll pass it to Rolando. Maybe Rolando, you could describe some of the future additions to the flood funding finder. Oh, that's great. I didn't know if I could get the green light on that. But um, no, we are very excited. We, um, of course, we have worked a lot with different U.S. Army Corps of Engineer projects, and we've been analyzing them um, with the analysts in the team and just coming up with ways to expand um, the resource that I just mentioned, the flood funding finder. There's about four to five programs from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that we'll be adding. Um, and then there are also many other uh, miscellaneous programs that we were um, are thinking of adding as well, but they all have to do within different lenses of um, adaptation projects, such as floodplain management services, 
and the like. Anna, if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I, I would just add that it was, um, you know, we really do respond to feedback from our coalition members. So in, in addition to the Army Corps programs, there were some others that were more broad Department of Defense funding opportunities that were suggested to us um, by some of our military members to include in the future. Um, so we are always looking for opportunities to collaborate with our military partners and members and find ways to make sure we're um, sharing out information, especially when it pertains to that um, partnership and relationship between the base and the communities that surround it. Well, that's really exciting to hear about the, the funding that they can spend um, for off-road, off-base roads because for access because Mayport Village, which is what's our topic for next month, um, there's basically one way, there's only one way in and one way out. And the road is prone to flooding. It's a two lane road, but it's also has access to our military base to Mayport. So that may, that might end up opening up a potential partnership with developing Mayport village, as well as, you know, uh, addressing the, the flooding, the flooding or the prone to flooding uh, for that access to the Mayport to the base as well. So that's that's really exciting. We'll have to um, share that with our speaker next month if she's not aware of that. Um, let's see. I, yeah, oh. absolutely. and oh. I would just want to oh. add, you know, it is part of our four pillars. So this is at the forefront of our work, uh, working with military installations and um, officials in the US military for sure. Okay, okay, well, that's good to know. Um, yeah, because we could certainly do some, you know, connect to that. Um, we were supposed to have our, our speaker was supposed to be the commander from Mayport last month, and unfortunately, scheduling wasn't uh, didn't allow him to do or, yeah, didn't allow him to do that. But, um, but that's good to know to, to be able to share that. Um, I guess my other question was, do you guys or, or um, do you work with um, organizations like land trusts? Here we have the Northeast Florida Land Trust and their job is to you know, purchase major tracts of land for conservation. And it's also, which feeds into everything that, you know, we obviously have been talking about tonight. Um, is that, a, 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 are those organizations that you guys also work with or have or Yes, absolutely. I can kick us off. And again, um, perhaps Alec and Rolando would like to chime in, but we absolutely welcome um, a, a whole broad range of civic organizations to join the coalition. So we do have a number of coalition members who are conservation focused organizations. Um, the Maryland League of Conservation Voters is one of those groups. And in that case, we often, uh, our, our relationship there is really one of sharing updates and information, especially when it comes to efforts at the state level um, that address flooding and, uh, and conservation goals as well. There's, there's certainly an overlap there. And so I think that's, that's emblematic of the type of uh, relationship that's, that's common for us. Excellent. And Rolando, you had worked with the National Park Service. I believe you'd said in your, in your bio, um, obviously National Park Service, state parks um are those also entities that you all are you know working with and developing relationships with um in this regard well you know since i started speaking about the military aspect and the defense the other part of that project of expanding our flood funding finder tool is to include about six to seven um projects for tribal governments and sovereign nations um and, the and programs that have that tribal um, asset to them. So the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior, of course, um, provide many of these programs. And many of them have to do with cultural um, perseverance or preservation, excuse me, and then also adaptation projects as well, but directly focusing on tribal government and um, tribal communities as well. Yeah, I think uh, what came to mind with me with the National Park was obviously the Castillo, um, Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. Oh, yes. 
because they are very concerned uh, with you know the potential sea level rise and the impact um, on that structure, you know, that treasure. So, um, yeah. well, do you have any closing any closing remarks? We're at seven fifty five. We like to end at eight o'clock. So we'd love to have any kind of closing remarks from any or all of the, our panelists. I'll chime in and just say thank you again for having us. And um, we're really so impressed by the work you do at Beaches Watch. And we were thrilled to, to join you this evening. And we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Dr. Yeah. Alec or Volando? Yeah, I was going to say that it, it's been great to be here and um, finally uh, able to collaborate with you all. Uh, Council Member Golding, we're so happy to work with you and just very excited for the work that Jacksonville Beach will be doing in the future. Well, thank you guys for having us and you have our contact information. So if you all need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Well, we really appreciate uh, the three of you joining us and, and sharing what the um, American Flood Coalition, all the great work that you guys are doing and the support and the resources that you have to offer uh, our communities, our elected officials, uh, working at the state level, national level, and all of that. So um, we look forward to continuing our conversation with you guys and hopefully continuing to build those relationships. So thank you again for joining us and um, stay safe. Um, so that concludes our meeting. Um, if you wouldn't mind to take about just two minutes to fill out our short meeting survey uh, at the end of this meeting, Again, you can watch it, the recorded uh, meeting tomorrow on our YouTube channel at Beaches Watch 2012. Obviously follow us on Facebook and visit our website, beacheswatch.com for, um, for more information about this panel and uh, this meeting and our future meetings. So good night, stay safe, and thank you for joining us.